Let's begin. The good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Ajay Avati, the Global Category Manager, Nutrition and Health, welcome you all to EW Nutrition's Partner in Progress Connect webinar series. Today's topic is solving critical gut challenges, innovations contributing to farm profitability. At EW Nutrition, we all are always excited to be part of our customer's journey to make animal production more sustainable and profitable. And part of this commitment is to bring the knowledge and innovative solutions to our customers. As we all know, gut health is the most important factor in reducing use of antibiotics and improving animal performance. It is very, very important that our innovations for the next generation solutions target gut health specifically. That is why at EW Nutrition, we always say, think outside the box and improve inside the gut. In today's session, our guests and panelists will discuss why broilers are prone to gut-related challenges, what stressors are at work, and how to tackle these challenges in modern broiler production. Let me introduce you to today's panel, Professor Richard Dukatel, Dr. Ruturaj Patil, Engineer Madalina Deakhanu, Dr. Twan Van Garve, and last but not the least, me as your moderator. Before we begin, a small note, please submit the questions you have in Q&A message board as we go along. We will strive to cover as many questions as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the session. But please be assured, if your question is, doesn't get answered due to time limit, we will address it directly to you post webinar in coming week. So to start with, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Richard Dukatel as our keynote speaker today. Words will be limited to acknowledge his contribution to the science of poultry gut health. In his glorious career spanning over past four decades, he had been scientific advisor to Belgian government, president of European Society of Veterinary Pathology, diplomat of European College of Veterinary uh, Poultry Science, as well as European College of Veterinary Pathologist. He is a professor emeritus of veterinary pathology and been member of executive board to the Ghent University. With all these important and responsible positions, he still managed to keep his passion for gut health science, knowledge and research burning. And it is very well evident with of more than four, 700 scientific publications and mentorship of more than 34 PhDs in the field of poultry gut health research. Professor Dukatel, it is an honor to have you as an invited speaker. We all are eager to listen to you and the stage is all yours. Please. So thank you, Dr. Awati for the kind words. And I want to try and share my screen now struggling with, uh, with the technology as usual. I will manage. So um, what I, um, I, I'm from the veterinary faculty of Ghent University and, and proud to say that this faculty has been uh, selected as the number one in the Shanghai ranking of best veterinary faculties in the world for the last five years. Um, and so um, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, new insights in, in gut health and, and gut challenges. And um, that is actually uh, a topic which um, uh, is, is, needs to be looked at um, in, in a, a, what I would call a, a, holistic, a holistic way, um, in, in a way that um, if we really want to understand um, the, the, what happens in the intestine uh, on a physiological basis and on the basis of interaction with the intestinal content and with the microbes, we need to uh, you know, take one step back and, and look at the, the driving forces of natural selection. And it's absolutely clear that one of these driving forces is indeed 
bacteria. Because when you look at the, the, the evolutionary tree, it is obvious that bacteria were on this globe millions of years before um, higher organisms evolved, before vertebrates evolved, before birds and mammals evolved, evolved let alone human beings. So, so these animals have um, evolved in, a, in, in an environment that was already occupied by the, by the bacteria. And it's always obvious in, also in industry that when you're the second in, in the competition, uh, you, you have to be very inventive to, to find your way and to, to get your share of the market. And, and this is actually holds also true for, for this evolutionary and this co-evolution between these different kingdoms of organisms. And um, of course, when you think of it, um, microbes are all around. And, and it's clear that especially in a poultry house, especially um, you know, uh, when the birds have been in the house for a longer period of time, there's huge numbers of microbes present in, in not only in the litter, but also in the, in the feeders and, and in the drinking water. And, and of course, this is the, uh, as the birds peg the environment, they take up these organisms. And, and because of the moisture and the high temperature in, in, the, in the intestine, microbes tend to multiply at a quite rapid rate. And, and that, um, uh, of course, induces more spread of bacteria. And of course, in the past, we were all, well, we were taught that, that microbes are bad and we need to treat uh, them and to kill them with antibiotics or with disinfectants. Uh, but we should realize that uh, at least 95% of the microbes are not pathogens. And, and a lot of them can even be beneficial. But you know, when you look at you know, the, um, the classical conditions in which birds are kept, it is generally estimated that, that with each gram or each mill that the birds swallow, they took, take up roughly 1 million uh, living microbes which are swallowed and which then pass down the intestinal tract. So the uptake of microbes, the continuous uptake of microbes is, is, is quite impressive. And so these microbes are then um, taken up and, and even, even, even if we talk about beneficial microbes, we should still realize that when you, when you carefully examine a microbial cell, the, the building blocks of this microbial cell are remarkably similar to the building blocks of a, a a chicken cell or a human cell. It, it indeed is built of, of amino acids and nucleic acids and lipids and even the trace elements to a large extent are uh, remarkably similar. Or in other words, that means that bacteria and chickens or uh, bacteria and their hosts compete for the same sort of nutrients. And, and that is an issue which we should realize when you, when you look at the function of the intestinal tract, because at the very site where the nutrients are taken up by the chicken, the bacteria should not have the opportunity to, uh, to compete and to take up these same nutrients. Uh, so um, keeping this in mind, uh, of course, we all realize that the first thing the microbes get in contact with after they've been swallowed is is the acidity of the proventriculus. And this acidity is quite severe in the chicken. Uh, it can easily go down to pH two. And what we did in this graph is we, we took one of these beneficial microbes, which we have been studying a lot in the lab, uh, which is called Butyricococcus, and it's a butyrate producing microorganism. And when you put it in contact with acid, uh, when you look at the full line, which indicates the culturability of the microbe, it drops down to undetectable levels and it takes a few hours before they pick up again and they can start multiplying in a culture medium again. But when you look at a dashed line and that indicates the viability, it is still there. So this indicates what we call the viable but non-culturable state. In other words, when bacteria are swallowed, some of them are killed by the acid, but the vast majority of them are not killed, but become viable, but non-culturable, meaning that they're kind of knocked out, that they cannot take up nutrients to multiply. And so they pass through the small intestine of the birds, 
without being able to compete for the nutrients because they are in this uh, special viable but non-coachable state due to the contact with the acid of the proventriculus. Now, uh, looking further down the intestinal tract, the microbes arrive, pass through the small intestine, and it's actually, especially in the duodenum and in the jejunum, that the absorption of the nutrient by the chicken is taking place. And that's why, where you don't want multiplication of the microbes, because that would mean competition for the nutrients. So at this very level uh, of the small intestine, the metabolically active uh, bacterial population is down to log three per, per gram. The, and this is about the concentration of microbes in normal tap water. So that means very low concentrations of metabolically active microbes. Now, that's important, of course, because in this small intestine, you have the epithelial cells, which are in this cartoon shown here in blue, the epithelial cells with their nucleus. And uh, above the epithelial cells is the mucus layer here, um, stained in orange. And these epithelial cells, they have the important function, especially the epithelial cells of the tip of the villus, their function is to take up the nutrients. This nutrient uptake is a receptor-mediated transcellular transport, meaning that the yellow triangles here symbolize receptors that are present for each and every nutrient that needs to be taken up. So all of these nutrients need to be taken up by a receptor-mediated transcellular transport indicated here by the, by the red arrow. So that it means that this is a pumping system, pumping the nutrients from the intestinal lumen across the mucus through the epithelial cell into the bloodstream. But of course, you, could, you realize that a pumping system like that can only work well when in between these pumps, everything is sealed so that nothing can leak back into the intestinal lumen. And these seals, they are called the tight junctions. These tie junctions are critically important for intestinal health. And there's a lot of research going on as we speak today about the stability of the tie junctions and how we can improve the tie junction um, stableness so that nothing leaks in between. So what happens, of course, when these tie junctions are damaged, then, then there may be contact with uh, anything that is leaking inside out towards the intestinal lumen or also leaking outside in, in a passive way. And that is a very dangerous situation. And these leaks can contain fragments of bacteria, which may trigger an inflammation, but they are also induced by heat stress. Heat stress on its own, can cause damage of the tight junctions and leads to leakage and so to possible contact of the basal lateral side of the epithelial cells with uh, bacteria and, and bacterial antigens. And this whole mechanism triggers a vicious circle of tight junction damage leading to inflammation. And this is a key word in the, in the intestinal health. Intestinal health means low level inflammation. Poor intestinal health means high level of inflammation. So um, the other aspect of course, is that when bacteria can leak through, they can get into the bloodstream and pass directly into the liver. And this is called bacterial translocation. So inflammation and bacterial translocation are two harmful consequences of tight junction leakage. And of course, what you can see here also is that in case of tight junction leakage, the so-called paracellular pathway is opening up and that leads to contact of intestinal content with these red dots here that are uh, receptors expressed on the side of the epithelial cells. These are not receptors for nutrients like the yellow triangles. They're a different kind of receptors. And these are uh, essentially 
the so-called toll-like receptors. And these toll-like receptors, there are several of them that are specialized in recognizing bacterial components like lipopolysaccharide, the flagellin from, from flagellated bacteria, and the lipopeptides that are anchored into the peptidoglycan layer of the bacterial cells. So these toll-like receptors recognize the bacteria, and as they are activated by binding of the bacteria that leak through, they uh, induce a cascade intracellularly that leads to the activation of a signaling mechanism called NF-kappa-B, and this NF-kappa-B is key in triggering severe inflammation. So what you see then when NF-kappa-B is activated is a whole cascade of effects, including essentially the most important one, in my opinion, is the induction of pro-inflammatory uh, and the induction of the expression of pro-inflammatory genes, like, for instance, interleukin-6, which will men be mentioned also uh, later on in this, uh, in this webinar. So this pro-inflammatory cascade is triggered by contact at the, at the lateral side of the epithelial cells with bacteria that are penetrating in between the cells. So um, you, it, it's obvious that even under these conditions where the bacteria have been knocked down by the contact with the acid, there's still some left. We saw that there's about log three left. And these can still cause some competition for the nutrients. So the, the host doesn't want these bacteria to come close to the epithelium. And that's why there is a number of defense mechanisms in place in the small intestine that are helping to avoid this competition for the nutrients. And these defense mechanisms, they are based on recognition of the surface of the bacterial cell. So when you look uh, in this square, when you carefully look at the bacterial surface, and we put this in a small cartoon, then uh, if the blue is the inside of the bacterial cell, the bacterial cytoplasm, it's surrounded by a plasma membrane, which is called the inner membrane. And then you have this peptidoglycan layer, which is a very tough protective layer on the surface surrounding the bacteria, protecting the bacteria. And in the gram-negative bacteria, you have another layer uh, which is actually the outer membrane, which contains the lipopolysaccharide. So this outer part is typical for the gram-negative bacteria. Now, if whether it's gram-negatives or gram-positives, if they come too close to the epithelium, they can compete for the nutrients and they need to be eliminated. And how does the host take care of that? Well, the first thing it does is uh, the epithelial cells secrete an enzyme which is called alkaline phosphatase. And this alkaline phosphatase is unique because it can attack and damage lipopolysaccharide, which otherwise is a very tough and very resistant molecule that cannot be broken down easily. But the alkaline phosphatase can do this. So it, it destroys the activity of the lipopolysaccharide taking away that outer coat of protection of the gram-negative bacterial cell wall. And then there's a, in the next step, there's the production of another enzyme, which is called peptidoglycan receptor protein. And this peptidoglycan receptor protein can drill holes in the peptidoglycan layer. And by drilling holes, it uh, causes leakage of, of bacterial internal content, which kills the bacteria. So, so this is a bactericidal molecule produced by the epithelial cells. Another of one of these bactericidal molecules is the xanthin oxidoreductase. And yet another one is, or uh, another collection of antibacterial substances are antimicrobial peptides, all produced by the intestinal epithelium to protect against bacteria coming close to the epithelium where absorption of nutrients is taking place. So the peptidoglycan drills holes, bacteria are killed. So what is left is peptidoglycan fragments. And what happens now is that the host uh, mucosa, the host epithelium also secretes another enzyme, which we all know it's called lysozyme. And lysozyme actually breaks down these peptidoglycan fragments into smaller, very small, the smallest 
biologically active uh, fragment that is produced is called muramyl dipeptide. Now you can imagine with like uh, long six bacteria being swallowed, all of these bacteria dying, there can be quite a lot of muramyl dipeptide that is present continuously in, in the intestinal lumen in the small intestine. And this muramyl dipeptide is sensed by the host as a signal that the conditions are favorable the microbes have been killed and completely broken down into their smallest fragments. So that means that absorption of nutrients can take place. That signal, that muramyl dipeptide signal is sensed by the NOT2 receptor, which is continuously activated and continuous activation of this NOT2 receptor allows, uh, um, allows absorption of the nutrients in the small intestine. So NOT2 activation is important for absorption of the nutrients in the small intestine. So taking into consideration, however, that uh, the broilers, the, uh, you know, the fast growing broilers, they have been selected for 50 generation, uh, for 50 generations for high feed intake, because you can only grow fast when you eat a lot. So these birds eat huge amounts, meaning that this amount of feed intake, it can overwhelm these natural defense mechanisms. And so the natural defense mechanisms, they can fail and they usually are uh, insufficient to protect against, to perfectly protect the environment of the small intestine. That is why um, in, in broiler production, uh, feed additives are used to support this protective system in the small intestine. And so if we take this one step further, we have looked at bacteria in general now, but if we start looking at the pathogens, then the picture uh, becomes different again, because with pathogens, what happens like, for instance, in the case of coccidiosis, well, coccidia, when, when the sporulated oocysts are taken up, the spores, uh, the, the sporulated oocysts um, uh, release their, their, spore, their, their spores and, the, and the, the organism is penetrating through the mucus into the epithelial cell and will multiply intracellularly. And so at each step of its replication cycle, coccidia will actually kill the cell in which uh, it is multiplying. And so at the next step of the replication cycle, another cell will be invaded and will be killed. And so this is taking place with the uh, all of the uh, Aymeria species and the, in the chicken, of course, we know that Aymeria isevrilina is important in the duodenum. Aymeria maxima is mainly affecting the jejunum and Aymeria tinellum is multiplying in the epithelial cells in the cica. And so by doing this, what happens is that there are uh, um, wide gaps in the epithelial layer appear meaning that there is leakage inside out and outside in. And this leakage, when then um, uh, the unfortunate situation happens that Clostridium perfringens is passing by, is spore forming bacteria, it can produce an enzyme uh, which is called collagenase. And this collagenase will damage the basal lamina because the basal lamina is composed of laminin and collagen type four. So the collagen is breaking down the basement membrane, which an normally anchors the epithelial cells into the, into the stroma. And so the epithelial cells will detach and then cl Clostridium perfringens can produce its well-known famous um, poultry specific toxin called NEDB, which will then cause uh, extreme necrosis of the uh, of the mucosa, and that is what you see. And the orange stuff is all necrotic material. So, if we then still have the time, Mr. Chairman, to just have a brief look at the at the microbiome of the cica, um, the microbiome in the cica of the chicken, we all realize that it is very important. It's very important, not so much because it's generating additional energy for the chicken. Um, this is just accounting for about 10% of the total energy requirement of the total energy provision 
comes from the microbiome. So that's not very important. But the most important effect of the microbiome is actually uh, signals that are produced by the bacteria that are present in the Zika, and that will be sensed by the hosts. And that will um, these signals will be picked up and the host will respond. And when the beneficial signals are produced by the microbiome, the host will respond by a very efficient activity of the absorption function of the intestine. When the signals, uh, these beneficial signals are no longer there or when other signals are formed, the opposite will take place and inflammation will ensue. So if we look at this uh, network of microbes that are present in the Zika, um, uh, what they fundamentally do is they live on the non-digestible fraction of the, of the feeds. And this non-digestible fraction is mainly composed of non-starch poly, uh, polysaccharides, high molecular weight polysaccharides that need to be broken down and that then lead to, you know, the microbes that break down these high molecular weight polysaccharides will, sides will then uh, cross-feed to other microbes and, and produce intermediate metabolites, which will ultimately be converted into, um, you know, the terminal metabolites of the microbial cross-feeding, which essentially are propionate and butyrates and to some extent, also some of the intermediate metabolites can become uh, terminal metabolites. So that is the traditional scheme. But what happens? Um, what happens is only possible when dietary fiber is um, present in sufficient amount and in a form which is approachable and which is digestible by the microbes. So the dietary fiber cannot be digested by the host. And it is composed of high molecular weight, very complex molecules that make up the cell walls of the plant cells, including cellulose, arabinoxylans, mannans, and you name it. And so these high molecular weight complexes are quite difficult to be broken down. And the, uh, the host needs specialized microbes in the Zika to break this down. And the thing is, that's the normal situation. In the abnormal situation, and that is especially so when overfeeding with too high amounts of protein in the diet, then there's a shift, a shift away from the butyrate and propionate producing populations towards the proteobacteria, which as one of their end metabolites produces hydrogen sulfide. And this hydrogen sulfide is toxic for the epithelial cells. So uh, it is uh, generally accepted now in the human uh, scientific literature that proteobacteria are a harmful phylum and they are considered the microbial signature of dysbiosis in the human gut. So the same actually has been found in the chicken. Proteobacteria should be avoided. There, there should be as much as possible avoidance of the shift from butyrate and propionate producers towards um, proteobacteria and enterobacteria CI. Simply because butyrate is probably one of the most important signals produced by the microbes. It stimulates mucus production, reduces inflammation, reinforces digunctions, and stimulates the, uh, the growth of the intestinal epithelial cells. So uh, this interkingdom signal needs to be favored, needs to be promoted to have a, a, a well-balanced intestinal microbiome and to have a, a good absorption of nutrients in the small intestine. So um, we realize that in case of dysbiosis, there is usually expansion of the proteobacteria, loss of the butyrate producers, and also not to forget expansion of the bacterial pro uh, populations from the Zika up into the small intestinal tract. And this is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is, uh, which is becoming more severe under heat stress and under coccidiosis challenges. So to wrap it up, Mr. Chairman, um, we, could, we should realize that the microbiome does indeed contribute to energy harvest. That's true, but the, the contribution is relatively modest. The microbiomes in the small intestine, however, they can compete with the host for the nutrients. So we need to avoid this. 
Uh, and since broilers have been selected for such high feed intake, the, the issue is that the defense uh, mechanisms in the small intestine are to some extent insufficient because of this extremely high feed intake. And this leads to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And feed additives, of course, uh, preferably should uh, help and support natural host defense mechanisms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ducatel. Uh, that was really insightful. And especially what intrigued me is that the, you bring out those evolutionary development between the microbiota and the host and the, the nitty gritties of their relationship. And I think it's very, very important the way we manage the microbiota can impact the health of an animal. So with, with that, especially, I would like to, that takes me to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ruturaj Patil, product manager. Being a vet himself with a decade of technical and commercial experience in international feed businesses, Dr. Rutaraj Patil, who will highlight the improving performance and gut health with using one such innovation that can impact the uh, microbial population in the gut. We call it Winter D. Rutaraj, stage is yours. Looking forward to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. And as Ajay mentioned, um, I would take opportunity uh, to share with you uh, uh, as we listen from uh, the gut, gut health challenges from Professor Dukatel, uh, how this can be managed with some phytogenic innovative solutions. So uh, to begin with, we all know that entry diseases are very costly. Yeah, so uh, some of the recent reference studies talk about that necrotic enteritis cost in broilers can be up to 6 billion US dollar annually, uh, which is a huge cost. We can uh, see into global uh, uh, broiler industry impact. And when it uh, comes to the cost impact, it is mainly coming because of the uh, effect on the performance, uh, which has been on an average, has been recorded that 12% reduction in the body weight and 10.9% increase in feed conversion ratio. So we can say that it always affect uh, the profitability and productivity of uh, broiler farms uh, uh, by necrotic enteritis. So to manage uh, or to mitigate the impact of necrotic enteritis uh, from EW Nutrition, we uh, uh, would like to share with a solution, Ventar-D. So what is Ventar-D? Ventar-D is a unique proprietary blend of phytomolecules complemented with innovative delivery system. Yeah, so it's a phytomolecule-based product. And uh, we also talk about the formulation, uh, the matrix, which is in equally important for delivering the active ingredients at the right side. So when it comes to the benefit of Ventadi, based on our commercial and uh, control trial experience, we can say that in broiler, Ventadi can help to improve the body weight gain by 3%. The feed conversion can be expected to get better by 2%. And it can also contribute for better livability in birds. So on an average, the overall cost benefit can be up to 5 US dollar cent per bird. So now you may ask actually how Ventadi can uh, contribute this or help uh, with this uh, cost benefit. And it actually start from the one of the first and key feature of the product, flowability. So this is the actual clip you can see on the left side of your screen, how actually the product look like. So Ventadi is a uniform particle size granulate, and it is very important uh, to have um, uh, the active ingredients uniformly available in the product because each and every particle of Ventadi brings the active ingredients, which also ensure the uniform mixability. So to measure the flowability, we also use some of the technologies being used by feed mill industry, uh, like Hausner ratio, which is commonly known to measure the bulk density of the product, car index, which is mainly known to measure compressibility of the product and angle of reports, which is uh, nothing but when we are pouring a product from some distance, 
and uh, it is getting stack. So we can imagine if the product is not free flowable, it will get stack like this and uh, the angle of repose will be higher. So better the flowable product, the lower the angle of repose. So with all these three techniques, uh, Pentadi is proven to be a very uh, an excellent flowable, which is also important uh, to ensure homogeneous mixing of the product. Then second important uh, point when it is being used through feed is about stability, or we can also call pelleting stability. So to measure the pelleting stability, we also compare Guventadi uh, uh, with a globally well-known phytogenic products, which are also uh, claimed to be encapsulated. So we tested Guventadi with a two time and temperature combination, like 70 degrees centigrade for 45 seconds, and 80 degrees centigrade for 90 seconds. And what we could see at both this time temperature combination, Ventadi was proven to be much better and stable than this competitor product, which ensures better availability, availability of active ingredients when it is being used through pelleted feeds. We also tested Ventadi even at uh, harsher and longer pelleting conditions like 90 degrees centigrade for 180 seconds. And even at this time temperature combination, Ventadi was found to be stable even with 84% recovery. So it helps to ensure that Ventadi can be even used in strict uh, feed hygienization process uh, like a salmonella control program. So now we know Ventadi is well mixable and stable uh, in the pelleted feeds. The next expectation will be always even related with the where actually it is active uh, or where it releases the act, uh, active ingredients. So with the innovative delivery system used in Ventadi, it helps to ensure the release of active ingredients at the right site. So through various trials, we tested Ventadi's uh, active ingredients availability inside the gut of the birds and it has been found that Ventadi active ingredients are available across the gut right from duodenum till cloaca, which is a common site for all common pathogenic bacteria to get infected. So by release of active ingredients at this right site, it also ensures the right benefit as well as optimized benefit of available active ingredients in the product. So now after uh, guaranteeing the release of uh, active ingredients at the right side, the most important thing to understand what are the mode of action of Ventadi, what benefit it can bring. So the Ventadi brings three major benefit. First is about antimicrobial property. Second, antioxidant property. And third is anti-inflammatory property. So I will explain you all three in a coming slide. First, to begin with, antimicrobial property. So to test antimicrobial uh, efficacy of the Ventadi, we tested Ventadi uh, against all common entropathogenic bacteria in broiler. Also in comparison to other competitor products, just to benchmark the antimicrobial activity. And you can see at the bottom of the table, Ventadi makes clear difference uh, by showing a better and stronger antimicrobial activity again, uh, compared to these competitor products against uh, commonly known pathogenic bacteria. So now, question may come in your mind, what about beneficial bacteria? So we also tested Ventadi's activity against beneficial bacteria. So for that, we use Clostridium perfringens as a common pathogenic bacteria and lactobacillus species just to compare uh, with a beneficial bacteria activity. So the first row where we actually did uh, agar dilution method test and uh, at different dose of Ventadi. So this is the first plate, which is without Ventadi, we can also call positive control. And then, then Clostridium perfringens only has been grown at different uh, level of Ventadi starting from 500 microgram per ml, 750 microgram per ml, and then 1000 microgram per ml. And what we could see a clearly a dose dependent activity of Ventadi as the concentration of Ventadi was going high, the Clostridium perfringens colony's growth was inhibited. 
and even 750 microgram per ml was good enough to completely stop growth of clostridium perfringens so we tested ventadi even at 25% higher concentration than this against lactobacillus species uh, like lactobacillus agilis and lactobacillus plantarum so this is positive control without ventadi and 1000 to 50 microgram per ml uh, ventadi been tested against lactobacillus agilis which as i said 25% even higher concentration than the highest dose tested for clostridium so both this lactobacillus species shown minimal effect of ventadi uh, which is a, a help us to ensure a very unique benefit for our customer by having a stronger antimicrobial activity of ventadi against pathogenic bacteria than beneficial bacteria which help to ensure the developing the gut microbiota in right direction next is about antioxidant activity so to measure antioxidant uh, capacity of ventadi we use a test all orac oxygen radical absorbent capacity test and in this test we compared antioxidant activity of ventadi against vitamin e analog so as you can see in the graph here at the all the concentration test state ventadi showed significantly higher antioxidant capacity than vitamin e analog so it clearly proves that ventadi possesses a stronger antioxidant capacity than vitamin e analog which also help to ensure better antioxidant status in the gut and it's help to protect the gut barrier functioning next is about anti inflammatory activity and to measure the anti inflammatory activity uh, we did a study in utrecht in netherlands with the cell line for murine macrophage so uh, we also applied a challenge uh, on these cell lines to stimulate or uh, uh, inflammation by lipopolysaccharide at 0.25 microgram per ml and then ventadi was added at dilution of 50 ppm and 200 ppm so as professor dukatel also mentioned about uh, the pro inflammatory response uh, and uh, to measure the inflammatory response we use biomarkers like nf kappa b and interleukins so in the first test nf kappa b activity which is known to trigger the inflammation so higher the nf kappa b activity higher the inflammation so as a positive control when there was uh, there was no challenge the cell line shown uh, lowest nf kappa b activity but when they were challenged with lipopolysaccharide we could see there was a very high increase in nf kappa b activity so after supplementation of ventadi at 50 ppm and 200 ppm we could see there was a dose dependent reduction in nf kappa b activity which also proves the anti inflammatory benefit of ventadi we also used another test uh, for comparison of interleukin 6 and interleukin 10 ratio so interleukin 6 is known to increase the inflammation and interleukin 10 is known to reduce the inflammation so the best indication of uh, inflammatory response is always interleukin 6 to interleukin 10 ratio so higher the ratio higher the inflammation so naturally in the challenge control we could see the il6 to il10 ratio was very high but when ventadi was been added at different dose we could see again uh, there was a dose dependent reduction in il6 to il10 ratio which was also statistically significant so it helps to prove that ventadi uh, possesses a strong anti inflammatory activity which help uh, during the high inflammatory uh, gut situations so till now we looked into feature and mode of action of product uh, through some in vitro studies so now let's get more practical and see the ventadi uh, benefit in in vivo condition or target species uh, that's in broiler so this is our first trial uh, which we did in a uh, us uh, in southern poultry feed research center uh, and we use cough finded birds in this trial and you can see it's a very uh, scientifically designed trial with 11 replicates 40 birds in each replicate the trial was continued for 42 days so for control 
there was no gut health additive and in ventardi group we added ventardi at 100 g per metric ton of weight we use a challenge model for this trial to stimulate actually uh, a gut health issues uh, for that the use liter was been uh, tried from the previous cycle of clostridium perfringens challenge to ensure high microbial load in the liter further the birds were challenged with high fiber diet just to create a malabsorption uh, and and create the high gut related issues so as a result we could see mortality there was a 2.6% reduction in mortality which is also significantly better than the control group we also did gut lesion score at day 21 and day 35 and there also there was a statistical significant reduction in the gut lesion score and on day 21 as well as same trend was observed on day 35 so this is actually a in vivo proof of anti inflammatory benefit of ventardi so as in previous slide we looked into in vitro test which was proving ventardi's anti inflammatory benefit so in in vivo condition lowering the gut lesion score is nothing but lowering the inflammation and this is i would say as a in vivo proof of uh, ventardi's anti inflammatory benefit so some more parameters from the same trial like body weight we could see 170 g extra body weight per uh, bird Uh, which is again uh, significantly better over control as epsia there was a 3 point improvement compared to the control group and overall results which is been measured through european performance efficiency factor epef we could see 35 points improvement in epf compared to control group which ensure the betterment in the performance with ventardi supplementation in high gut challenge conditions another trial uh, which is from european condition uh, in ross 308 birds uh, with similar challenge model and design here we had 13 replicates with 14 birds and we applied the similar challenge model uh, with same uh, similar group of control versus ventardi at 100 g per metric ton of feed so as a result we could see body weight there was 130 g extra body weight compared to control group uh, in ventardi group as a, uh, a result in a feed conversion ratio there was a 5 point improvement in feed efficiency uh, which is statistically significant and overall performance uh, european performance efficiency factor there was 33 points improvement uh, in ventardi group over control group. so this also proves that ventardi was able to support the high gut challenge conditions so to um, ensure that ventardi even can help the performance uh, of the birds even in high performing birds not only in the gut challenge birds we did this test uh, in jordan university where the birds were been fed with high dense diet uh, with uh, fast growing birds so in this we did the trial with ross 308 birds with the nine replicates and 22 birds the trial was been continued for 35 days and ventardi was added at the same dose of 100 g per ton so as a result we could see uh, the body weight which is almost same in both group but at 35 days 2.43 kg body weight was uh, very very high even uh, more than a breed standard fcr we there was a 3 point improvement in fcr uh, over control group mortality 1.6% reduction in mortality in ventardi group and as a impact of overall performance we could see epf there was a 21 points better epf uh, than a control group so you can see 463 epf which is very high performing birds and in spite of those uh, high performing birds ventardi was still able to bring the benefit with a better feed conversion ratio and better uh, livability in the bird so as a result Uh, in this trial uh, we could able to show return on investment of 1 as to 4.2 which can also been uh, contributed of additional cost benefit of 3 us dollar cent per bird so based on uh, the various trials we have uh, from different breeds uh, different locations uh, even different management practices 
VentID is proven to be uh, improving the performance consistently. Uh, if you look into uh, the performance trials uh, from various trials we have, uh, VentID is able to show consistent improvement in the performance. But interestingly, if you look into uh, the EPF comparison uh, with the lowest performing birds, the improvement brought in by Ventadi was highest, which is uh, certified that with high gut challenge conditions, there is a better scope of improvement for Ventadi uh, in the performance. So Ventadi is a consistently improving the broiler performance across uh, different breeds different management practices and different gut level challenge conditions. And uh, as if you have a higher problem in the gut issues, Ventadi can able to support the performance much better way. So as an application, we recommend to use Ventadi at 100 gram per metric ton of feed in broilers for throughout the life. So right from the day zero till finishing stage, we recommend to use Ventadi. So as a summary, uh, Ventadi we call as a, one of the best in class gut health solution because it comes with unparalleled thermostability, uh, thermostability which is proven to be much better than other uh, benchmark products. Site specific release of active ingredients ensure uh, the availability of active ingredients at the right site. Differential antimicrobial activity uh, of Ventadi also help to ensure the gut microbiota development in the right direction. The high uh, superior antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity ensures better gut barrier functioning. And with various trials, uh, it has been proven that Ventadi can support consistently in different commercial conditions, the performance of the broilers. So this was my last slide. And if you have any questions, maybe we can discuss in Q&A session. Thank you. Over to you, Ajay. Thank you, Ruturaj. That was really great. And it is very interesting to see how a well-directed innovation can result in the next generation solutions with this selective antimicrobial activity. And this is something very important when you are applying the phytogenic solution, that the selective antimicrobial activity. Of course, managing my microbial population is very important. But as we understood from Professor Ducatel's uh, presentation, that minimizing the impact of coccidiosis is also very important. And I believe that the improving the efficacy of the coccidiosis control program is of paramount importance to really reduce our dependency on antimicrobials in animal production while maintaining profitability. And with that note, I would like to introduce our next speaker, engineer Madalina Deakonu, who is also product manager an animal scientist herself with more than five years of experience in coccidiosis control solutions. Madalina will introduce an innovation to help reduce impact of AMRI challenges and improve effectiveness of coccidiosis control programs. Madalina, the floor is all yours. Thank you, AJ. Hello to everybody. So as you said, uh, for sure, coccidiosis it's a it's still a very big problem in our uh, in our farms today. So Pretech D was developed to train the coccidiosis control programs in a natural way. Uh, the product it's very important to understand how it works. So what we saw until now is that uh, this property blend of phytomolecules that are also including saponins and tannins can supportly the, can support the efficiency of your all coccidiosis control programs by impeding the media development. In most of the trials that we've done until now, we saw that we can effectively reduce the spread of the disease by decreasing the oocyte excretion. We can also have a protection of the epithelium from inflammatory and oxidative damage. The same, we can promote the restoration of the barrier function and, very important, it can be used in combination with vaccines, ionophores, chemicals as a part of a shuttle or rotation program. But let's see why the pro product really works or how it works. Pretech D, we say in the UK, we say all the time that you need for you, you need two for tango. And in this case, Pretech D can answer to the need of the market. We have tannins, 
and we also have, like I said, saponins. But to make it more efficient, we choose specific type of tannins and specific type of saponins. In this case, we choose hydrolyzable tannins and condensed tannins. These tannins will offer a better, fun a better buyer function. And with the help of saponins, we can have a direct eff effect on the oocyte. Again, a specific type of saponins, the titerpenoid and also the steroidal one. But let's say, let's see how it really works. We know that Imeria is all over. We can find it in all the gut during a long period of the life cycle. And we also know that depending on the location, we can see if there are lesions or not. That's why we choose to use hydrolyzable tannins because they have a systemic effect and also because they are absorbed in the small intestine. That means that with the help of this molecule, we can offer a better protection against Imeria sulfurina or Imeria maxima. Also, we choose to use the condensed tannins that have a local effect. Maybe they are one of the less molecules that we find today on the market that have a direct effect or a higher molecular weight and a more complex structure than the hydrolyzable one, and they can reach the cecum. So that's why with the use of Pretec D, we can have also a clear protection against immediate NLA. But how the saponins are working or why we use them? Because they have a clear effect. They are killing the oocytes. They are stopping the spreading of Imedia. They have two ways of working. The titerpenoid saponin will prevent the growth of the protosal parasite and can modify the structure and the function by killing the parasite. It's entering in the cell and can destroy it. The second type of saponin used in our product is the steroidal one that has maybe a different effect, but it also can kill, like the studies showed until now, the parasite. This process, it's to hinder the further sporulation. So we can, this type of saponin will create pores on the oocyte and will just stop the sporulation. But let's see what's going on exactly when we put the product in the feed in different trials. So we saw in all the trials that were done all around the world that we can have an improved uh, performance production. We can also have a better intestinal morphology, an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect, and of course, a reduced oocyte shielding and lesion scoring. One of the trials that were done in the United States were done together with the, with the vaccination. So in the control group, we used the natural strength of the vaccine, and we had our group with pre -technique. You can see here that at each period of the feeding phases that were changed, Pretec D performed better than the control group. Even at 40 to, uh, 42 days, we can see a significant difference of body weight between the control group and Pretec D. But if I go further, you can see that we also had an impact on the feed conversion. So with the use of Pretec D compared with the control group, we have six points reduction in the FCR. Also, if you are talking about the performance efficiency factor, we can see here that the differences are significant between the control group that was only using vaccine and the group where we put also PTG. But I said at the beginning that we have this antioxidant capacity. So I would like to explain maybe a little more about this. We had a different trial in uh, in China, a trial where we use a challenge of tenella to make sure that we really have a high inflammation in the gut. In this specific uh, specific trial, we use two doses of Pretec-D to see what if there is any difference between a larger or a lower dosage. And you can observe here that this trial that was done in the University of Qingdao, in University of Agriculture in China, we used uh, more than 400 uh, day old broilers and the groups were divided in four and we had 10 replicates for each group. The challenge group were orally inoculated with uh, sporulated oocytes of Imeria tenella on day 14. Compared to the challenge group, 
you can see that we have higher level of total antioxidant capacity, including superoxidismutase and also glutathione peroxidase. A lower level of MDA, that is also an indicate, uh, indicator of oxidative stress for protect D groups. In the same time, we also check for the oocyst fecal output. And you can see here that we have significant difference and we have a reduction of more than 50%. But if we go further, we can also see that in this trial, we check also the cytokine profile. And we can see here that even if we compare the two doses of pre D with the control, we always have a better, better result. The reduction of the gut wall damage indicates less grave degradation. And also, we can see that interleukin 6 and interleukin uh, 10 that are specifically for inflammation, in this case, interleukin 6 and TNF alpha, that are pro inflammatory cytokines, and interleukin 10, that is an anti inflammatory cytokine, compare with the control group and also with the challenge group, they perform better, and we have statistically different in all, the, in all the, the groups. Going further in the same trial, we also want to see what's going on with the intestinal morphology. So you can see here that the reduction of the gut wall damage indicates indicated by less grave degradation of the villi compared with the challenge group. And that's why we can say that pretty shows his effect of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant product. And also, if you take a look at the virus and crib depth, you can see that with the use of PreTech D, we can almost maintain the same intestinal morphology like the non challenge group. But sometimes we know that the studies that are done in universities are very important, but it's also very important to see what's going on at the customer level, what's going on in a commercial situation where we have different type of um, different type of challenges. In this specific case, we use the product in Europe, <coughs> sorry, in, uh, in a normal program. So the control was with classical coccidiosis program that the client had already in his facilities. And in the group with pre -D, we use pre -D for the second grower and the finisher period, because there is no withdrawal period for a natural solution. And you can observe here that if we are taking the FCR, we have three points difference in real condition, almost 200 grams in body weight, a better uh, performance efficiency factor, and of course, less mortality. Maybe it's important to say that the mortality in this farm was very high after 21 days. That's why they choose to use a higher dosage of Pretect. But the explanation for this high mortality after 21 days, I think is very easy because if we look at the second slide, we can see here that day 28 and day 35, they always had a very big challenge in the farm with very high level of lesion score, almost at four. And with the use of pre D, from the beginning, we had a less, uh, we, we, the, uh, we lowered the, the lesion with one point at day 35, and by day 42, we had two points different in lesion scoring. All these differences can be observed also in the OPG counting. You can see here that we start at a, li at a higher level of infection in the farms, and by the end of the cycle, we have better results than the normal coccidiosis program. So for sure, pre D can be used in combination in all your programs without any problems. But just a short conclusion, it could be that we know that the product is working because we saw until now during our old trials that are done all around the world, that we can improve the gut barrier function. We can also improve the immune response against the media and of course the beneficial microbial population. But most important, we can reduce the replication and growth of humedia. We can also reduce the inflammation and the lesion and the harmful microbial population. But 
I said at the beginning in the very first slide that it can be used in combination with vaccination or ionophores or chemicals. And I would like to finish with this slide with our potential application of the product because today around the world, the product is used in different ways. One of the most uh, easy way people are using the product in the withdrawal period because they always have some coccidial left and they always need the protection in this specific period. The most common one is the second program where we have a coccidial start until day 21, for example, and we go further with PTEC. Also, we know that there are seasons when the infection in the farms is not so high. So with a very good uh, screening of the farm before, we can use also PTEC-D without any problems during the whole cycle. And more specific maybe for uh, for uh, United States, the use of vaccine where it's very, uh, the vaccine is very to use, it's to use PTEC-D together with the vaccine after 21 days, depending on which type of vaccine you are using. Mm, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask and we can also answer after uh, after the webinar. The product also have a shelf life of 24 months and the packaging is uh, 20 kilos. Thank you so much and hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Madalina. Uh, that was really great. Uh, if I really see with three of you presenting on a different topic, say uh, Professor Ducatel going from the whole evolutionary development from the microbiota and host to evolve together and highlighting the importance of managing microbiota where Ruturaj also shown the, how important it is to have an uh, innovation which can work on both the microbiota and the host. And you are underlining the same similar principle for the uh, coccidiosis, uh, making coccidiosis control programs more effective. I think this is very important that we are talking about this uh, play between the, uh, the or relationship of symbiosis between the microbiota and the host. Yeah, with that, now we go to the uh, session of Q&A. Uh, but before moving on, I would like to introduce our final panelist. Uh, with his team uh, will be very in, uh, instrumental in taking these innovations to our customers, Dr. Thuan Van Garve, our global technical director. From being a poultry vet, uh, a field poultry vet, uh, to achieving PhD from uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands, to gain experience at high level R&D and technical positions in leading organizations in industry, Tuan has evolved as a leading expert in the gut health in commercial poultry production. With that, I open the session for question and answer, and I can see there are a few questions coming in. Uh, uh, the first, and uh, I move with the first and uh, very interesting question to Professor Ducatel. Uh, uh, Professor Ducatel, uh, the question is about, you talked particularly about the inflammation. Is the inflammation also common in the perfectly healthy birds? Or is it just a uh, phenomena in the, in the challenge or disease birds? That's indeed an interesting question, Dr. Avati. Um, I must say, if I, if I go back in my career, I have looked at you know, large numbers of histological sections from intestinal tracts of birds. And you know, each time I was looking at these histological samples, each and every time I saw inflammation, a varying degree of severity uh, though, but there was always inflammation. And I thought there was something wrong with me. So um, for a long time, this has been puzzling me until I found um, relatively recent literature in, uh, on, about, uh, from human pathologists uh, who um, uh, actually coined the term physiological inflammation in the way that it is now generally accepted that there is always inflammation in the gut. But this inflammation is in the perfectly healthy situation, it's at a relatively low level, but that also means that it can be easily upregulated. And you may wonder why there is always physiological inflammation. 
But the thing is that we all know that the intestinal mucosa is a huge surface, a massive surface. Um, they compare it with, you know, like football fields and all that, depending on the, um, the species, you know, this. Uh, but the thing is that this huge surface is protected only by a single layer of epithelial cells. So you can imagine that there is always, even in a perfectly healthy situation, there will always be a, a, a small, small micro lesion here and there. And, and this, here and there, some epithelial cells that, that, that may occasionally fail. And, and this, is, this is enough, of course, to, to get um, you know, um, compounds from the intestinal lumen leaking in between the epithelial cells and getting in contact with these, these um, you know, toll-like receptors, which I talked about earlier on. And that uh, the toll-like receptor activation, by definition, through the NF-kappa-B pathway is triggering the inflammatory pathway. And so that means that there will always be a trigger of the inflammatory pathway. But of course, in the chicken, it's, um, it's, it's more pronounced simply because in the field, in practice, you, you cannot raise a single chicken without coccidiosis. And so as I explained earlier on, the amiria at each step of the replication cycle, the amiria is destroying an epithelial cell. And in the, you know, when, in one cycle, one cycle of, for instance, amiria um, acervilina is killing a hundred, you know, when you put one sporulated orchist in a bird, in, you know, we're looking at a theoretical example now, if one sporulated orchist will kill 100,000 intestinal epithelial cells. So that means a lot of leaking tight junctions. And that means a lot of trigger for inflammation. So the big issue in the intestine is actually, because inflammation is a vicious circle, these may run out of hand. So they need to be, you know, like um, dampening down feedback mechanisms. And one of the important dampening down mechanism is through the production of butyrate by the microbes from the Zika. And another one is the endogenous production of PPAR gamma. So there's different ways how this inflammation is, is kept under control, but it can easily run out of hand, for instance, when the birds are fed too high amount of protein. And I think this is a mistake that is often made in the industry. Oh, we'll bit, put a bit more protein just to make sure uh, that's a big mistake because higher concentrations of proteins in birds that are known to eat massive amounts means that not all this protein will be absorbed will be digested and absorbed in the small intestine and excess protein is a, a typical fuel for the proteobacteria and as i explained earlier on proteobacteria are a, a very powerful trigger of inflammation on the one side, because they contain the LPS, which is the most powerful trigger of inflammation in nature. And on the other side, of course, because they also produce hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic for the epithelial cells. I, I will leave it there because I, would, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> this is not personal. Yeah, but th th this is very interesting. So if I see clearly from the production point of view, uh, inflammation is a double whammy for the bird. So on one hand, because if there is in, uh, excessive inflammation, gut doesn't function well. So the job that gut, gut has to do is to absorb nutrients. It's not happening right way. So digestibilities are affected. But at the same time, the maintenance cost of intestine increases. So nutritionally, it's actually quite an expensive thing to manage. Absolutely. So if we don't keep the inflammation under control. Now, speaking of inflammations and to controlling it, of course, you also touched to the coccidia. So with that also, Madalina, there is another question for you. How does uh, the pre-take D particularly mitigate the emeria related inflammatory challenges? Thank you, Andre. Uh, as I explained earlier, and I think Dr. Ducatel explained even better, in case of emeria, we need to make sure that we have a clear overview on the gut. And the way the pre-take D answer to this challenge, I think it's kind of simple because it brings two different phytomolecules that work in two different ways. One on the host and the other one 
on the parasite. It's in a complete synergy. That's why we choose these tannins that will create a barrier effect by reducing the inflammation and the saponins that have a direct effect on the oocytes and will decrease the spread of hemeria. <coughs> I'm sorry. And that's why I think both these products, both these molecules will create this synergy that will offer a complete protection against hemeria. Okay, so this is what you mean when you presented it to call it as a, you always need to for the tango. Absolutely. To, to work in synergy with each other, to work on the mucosa and work on the, uh, on the pathogen at the same time to get the maximum results out of it. That's great. With, with that also, the, also we were talking, also Ruturaj was talking in his presentation about managing microbiota. So Ruturaj, there is a question for you. How an innovative solution like Venta-D can help to modulate the gut microbiota? So can you put a little bit more light on that part? Yeah. Sure, sure, Ajay. Uh, in fact, I would say that was one of the aim of our formulation development. Uh, so while screening of active ingredients for Venta D, we looked into the active ingredients which had a, a lower MIC value, minimum inhibitory concentration value for pathogenic bacteria. Meanwhile, they will also have a higher MIC for beneficial bacteria. So we wanted to have a product which will have a, a selective mode of action, a stronger against pathogenic bacteria than beneficial bacteria. And if you look into in vivo condition, when these pathogenic bacteria and beneficial bacteria are together and Ventadi is being uh, fed to the birds, naturally as Ventadi possesses stronger activity against pathogenic bacteria, it will inhibit their growth first. And that allows the beneficial bacteria to flourish better. And it, it helps actually to develop the gut microbiota in the right direction. Yeah, so this, this is, you mean to say, that we need to manage them in a such a way that the beneficial microbes grow better, the pathogenic population gets controlled, and we need to choose the solutions we put in that facilitates this process. So we, with that, because of course, then uh, what is the good microbiota in small intestine? Uh, Professor Ducatel, you touched this point uh, uh, slightly, but I would like to take that into a question here, uh, which says, uh, uh, why bacterial overgrowth in small intestine is deleterious to the animal performance and gut health? Uh, well, th this, is, this is not an easy question, Dr. Avati, uh, <laughs> in, in the way that there is still, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a controversial issue in the literature about the microbiome of the small intestine. Um, what, it, what is clear is that um, you know, in, in, the, in the human medical world, people have been aware of this longer than we have, simply because uh, the uh, uh, internists, the medical doctors, they, when you have a, 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 an intestinal complaint, they do endoscopy. And so they, they put this tube in, in your mouth going right down to your stomach, and they go, can go from your stomach into your duodenum. And there they take samples. And, and they saw that in some people, uh, well, in the people with certain complaints, they found like more than long five bacteria per mil of, uh, of sample they took from the duodenum. And as I explained in my presentation, there should be around about log three bacteria per mil. And so they uh, decided that this was the cutoff, you know, when the uh, numbers would exceed log five per mil, they classified this as a disease which they named small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or abbreviated SIBO. And so when you're diagnosed with SIBO, uh, it is now accepted to be a specific disease with specific symptoms which need to be treated. Uh, but of course, in the chicken, we are not looking at a specific disease, but we also see that under conditions where the bacteria in the small intestine start expanding, there is an issue simply because of the bacteria that trigger the inflammatory process. So you will have more inflammation, meaning less absorption of nutrients, but also these metabolically active bacteria, they take away a lot of the nutrients that uh, are there ready to be absorbed by the host. 
So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is actually an issue also in animal production and specifically so in the broiler for the simple reason that you know, with broilers that have been selected for feed intake like over 50 generations, it is more of an issue nowadays that broilers are eating too much, are overeating rather than you know, they should not eat enough. But overeating means that you are overwhelming the protective mechanisms that the pH in the, in the proventriculus is not dropping down to pH 2, but it, it stays between 3 and 4. And so more bacteria survive that uh, defense mechanism of the proventriculus and multiply them in the duodenum. And especially in case of ileus, meaning that when the when the peristaltic waves in the small intestine are slowing down or are even, you know, stand, when the content is standing still, then you get massive bacterial overgrowth. And that is one of the, the big challenges. So control of bacteria in the small intestine was actually one of the ways um, an antibiotic growth promoters were protecting the birth um, at the time when we used these growth promoters. And, and also, of course, it is well established in, in the human literature that these bacteria that are present in the small intestine, they are involved in hydrolysis of the bile salts, meaning that the emulsifying effect of the bile salts is not working very well anymore. And that also has a negative effect on, on of course, um, intake of the of the lipids and on um, energy uh, absorption from the intestinal nutrients so uh, yeah this is truly very interesting because these insights also tells us more about how agps really work when we, we were using them of course with rising amr uh, that the threat that they pose under responsible production of as much as we can reduce the use of dependency on them is always better but with that, well, I got one question, and I think maybe Tuan, this is more directed to you. Uh, one of our audience wants to know, it says, in my country, the use of AGPs is still very common. So there are no regulatory uh, uh, compulsion to remove. And there is a fear to take out the antibiotics. So will the newest generation of gut health additives allow for the antibiotic-free broiler production? So what's your opinion on that? Antibiotic free broader conduction. Yes. Broader production. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, really um, the extreme opposite from uh, many situations where AGPs are still uh, commonly applied. I think first we see more of a trend that firstly AGPs are banned and then later on when I make the distinction here between simply AGPs uh, low doses of antimicrobial drugs in the feed versus, and then a therapeutic use of a therapeutic level of antibiotics at the farm level, mostly, uh, sometimes also by feed. I think antibiotic-free production, if I understand the question correctly, to me would be in, uh, production without using any antibiotics, like, um, like in non-antibiotic ever systems, um, uh, definition coming from the US where this shift from commonly using AGPs to majority of the production now being NAE happened um, over the course of less than five years, uh, um, mainly. So, so it's quite a, 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 it was quite a change also in that country and with a lot of um, measures that need to be taken that go uh, definitely the, um, the science of uh, modern gut health additives, phytogenic solutions is, has been evolving. Uh, 20 years ago, we would talk about essential oils and we, 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 there was research done on it, but the active composition uh, could vary from one batch to the other. And uh, we didn't really uh, um, focus the research specifically on the active components within. That has changed. And, and that has made also the research that has been done in that area more valuable because then you could refer to the um, uh, understanding of mode of action of specific active components within these uh, uh, traditional products and use them in a standardized manner 
uh, use them in, in, in research, in product development. So I would say with, with the processing scientific knowledge of vital molecules, I think that they are really a solid uh, provider of gut health support, allowing for uh, uh, removal of AGPs, but then to go to um, um, an AGP, sorry, an antibiotic free production system, I think we need to go one step further and look into um, um, additional solutions, tools, but also more holistically into management, vaccination, hygiene, biosecurity to um, eventually uh, uh, tailor the solutions to the, to the farm specific challenge that we have. And um, I think also here there's uh, very much in line with what Professor Ducatel was saying, this particular issue of overgrowth of bacteria in the upper um, intest GI tract, there you, you might want to use uh, uh, more con higher concentrations of active components that are specifically uh, available in already to a high amount in that part of the of the intestines and these ep the, these times of increased intestinal challenge eh, uh, think about coccidiosis it's it's quite timely we know when typically a producer would know when the highest coccidiosis challenge occurs and that is when you wa might want to uh, provide additional support uh, through water application uh, most 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 practically so yeah uh, i hate to use the word but i think that holistic approach uh, in a farm specific manner is really uh, the way um, but uh, coming back to your question i think that the fear to remove agps i think with the current technology is not really um, needed anymore i think that uh, there there is good, uh, great um, technologies there, uh, and also to go even beyond AGP removal to, towards antibiotic-free. By the way, I'm a veterinarian, so I always want to emphasize that eventually it's not about, it doesn't per se have to be about always producing antibiotic-free. We need to maintain the welfare of our animals that we uh, are taking care of. So, so very important that we that antibiotics remain available in those situations where we did not manage to to prevent disease that so we can still treat the animals but the reduced use of these antibiotics is critical in that in that in that context because that way you can keep them effect, effective if you use your vaccine your antibiotics routinely you'll develop antimicrobial resistance and then even that what i would call last resorts uh, option that disappears. Yeah, I, th I think Tuan uh, completely agree. I think you bring two, three very important points in your, uh, your answer here. Because one point is about the technology, understanding of animal production, the biosecurity, the, the uh, animal feed, the breeds, the overall management, the understanding is now at the level, including the feed additive technologies, that we are there, that it's all about the intent. It's not about whether we can or we cannot. It's about the intent. And the US industry has shown that intent very yeah, kudos to them that they have achieved uh, now the significant production going antibiotic free. But at the same time, you also touched the other point of keeping the antibiotics more relevant for the human health and the veterinary health where they are needed. So I think that is also part of this responsible production, very important part, how we manage that uh, with bringing such technologies to the market. Yeah, so you are right, the fear is gone now. Those days are gone. We, we know, we understand how it works and we can take it there. So uh, I wish I could keep going, uh, but time is under no one's control. Uh, there, there are questions still unanswered. I can see in the Q&A box. Uh, I apologize uh, for not being able to deal with all of them during this session. However, we will be more than uh, happy to pick up our conversation via email. So we will uh, get in touch with you to answer your questions. And even after this session, if you have any questions, please send them to an email address, says webinar at ew-nutrition.com. I repeat, it's webinar at ew-nutrition.com. All questions will be routed to us and uh, We'll make sure our experts, uh, panelists, answer those questions and we come back to you. So uh, 
and also this recording of this session will be available uh, in next days in our uh, company website. Uh, so I thank personally the Professor uh, Ducatel uh, for being expert pre presenter in this session, our panelists, and more importantly, all of you, our audience, who took their time to be here and also your questions. So before say uh, bye, I would like to say stay safe, keep up the good work, and bye for now. Have a nice evening, a nice morning, a nice day. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.